Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Item 44 is a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into the purchase of real property from the BNSF Railway Company. Thank you, Council Chair and Council Members. Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. I have our Project Manager, Josh Peterson, and Assistant City Attorney, Diane Best, here. Uh, we have a brief PowerPoint presentation for you, but uh, we're fortunate to finally bring you one of the uh, key milestones that's been a community priority for um, over a decade. And so uh, we'll get started. <laughs> Um, I'll take you through the um, real high-level part of the purchase agreement. Um, Diane Beth will take you through more in depth of the terms, and then um, Josh Peterson will take you through the cost to date and the expected costs uh, for this project. Essentially, it's just over 10 uh, acres of land right in the heart of downtown. Um, it includes that area that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, that building that's uh, noted in red will be also a part of the acquisition and a part of the agreement is for us to demo that. Purchase price is $27,334,500. This is full compensation to BNSF uh, to complete this transaction. Um, a, cons a, a key point is after uh, the um, uh, with your consideration and what we would ask is for your approval a uh, part of the time frame between um, execution of the agreement and and ultimately closing there is a two hundred thousand dollars of earnest money that we've agreed to and then there is a two-year transition period that BNSF is provided uh, to build the necessary assets uh, to allow them to change their operation uh, and then ultimately complete this uh, transaction I'll bring up Diane Best. She'll take you through the next slide that takes you more in depth with some of the terms of the agreement. Good evening. Before I get into the actual terms of the agreement, I want to respond to a question that one of the council members asked me to address here this evening. And that is the uh, negotiation process. Uh, as an, an, all of you know, uh, the city has a website that provides a great deal of information regarding the environmental assessment, past council presentations, uh, uh, MOU with historical preservation, a number of other um, matters, including environmental matters. The nego and, and of course, to, tonight you have the contract before you, the purchase agreement that you're being asked to approve. So the question was um, whether the, why the city administration was, was not able to provide a copy of the appraisals leading up to the purchase agreement or a copy of um, any negotiation notes or to discuss the negotiation itself. Uh, fair question. Um, and that, of course, is one that we were, had to receive our guidance from, from uh, the Federal Highway because that's the, the funding for this. And Federal Highway has actually rules implementing the Federal Uniform Relocation and Assistance Act and the funding is provided pursuant to that act, and that's the guideline. <clears throat> and the express rule provides that records maintained by an agency in accordance with uh, acquisitions under the Relocation Act uh, are confidential regarding their use as public information, and those records include appraisals, uh, uh, um, negotiation records, and real estate negotiations. And so that is, that is the reason that those sorts of matters cannot be uh, made public. Now, then the next question is, does this conflict with South Dakota's public records law? And it does not. The state public records law was crafted with that specific exemption in mind. Um, it agrees with the federal law, so it, it provides that that's an exemption. The underlying rationale 
as I understand it, for those sorts of exemptions are that if you make bits and pieces or all of appraisal information public, that as you go along, um, the timing, uh, the emphasis on certain items, um, how it's presented could have a tendency to cause the market at large to, to, to um, uh, either depress or increase prices uh, and encourage speculation. So the idea was, is you, what you don't do is you don't uh, cause your negotiations to change the market at large. So that's, that's my understanding of the rationale behind the federal rule and that's, that's why uh, we took, have taken the position we have and we believe me, um, it would have been a great opportunity to uh, uh, provide some, uh, maybe those appraisals and that, but what we specifically asked Federal Highway and they declined to allow that to occur. Um, so I wanted to get that out there right away. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you uh, is the purchase agreement, as we walk through it, it provides that the city will be acquiring title to a, a little over 10 acres, 10.015 acres, and that is a title. Review is undertaken by the city attorney's office, uh, principally myself. The title records for this property are held by the Minnehaha County Register of Deeds. They were reviewed. The land at issue was originally granted by the United States to early Sioux Falls settlers. It was never part of, a, uh, of one of these federal land grants to railroad corporations where there were easements across the country. There were a number of those acts elsewhere. In this case, uh, all of the land at issue was originally granted by the U.S. to settlers in uh, a quarter section uh, tracks. Um, and those stem from um, a, a Veterans Widows Act, uh, military script, and uh, a second veterans, uh, heirs of a veteran. And they stem back, going back to the um, 1880 timeframe. Uh, the settlers held the patents for the property. Uh, the, Property was used for various purposes, but they did sell in fee strips of land to uh, the predecessors of the railroad that is selling it to um, the city of Sioux Falls at this time. So I am, can report to you the issue has been examined and the uh, city attorney's office is prepared to tell you that, the, that the, uh, we are purchasing through title. Um, a question, one of the, so as going through the document, one of the things that you'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that you will find is that the conveyance to the city of Sioux Falls is by means of a quit claim deed. That is different than uh, what is now the modern practice of uh, providing for um, sales of uh, homes. It is, the, but it is the current practice Quick claims are the current practice for railroad uh, acquisitions. That's how railroads are uh, tracks and railroad companies are bought and sold is through quick claim deed. That's the historic practice and that remains the practice today. When obtaining a quick claim deed then, the seller obtains, or the buyer obtains all the right title and interest that the seller had. So it's incumbent on the buyer to go back and look at the title. And as I indicated, the title, um, uh, you would be uh, obtaining good title to the property, fee title to the property. But uh, that diligence is required. That's how railroad property is offered for sale. It was not offered for sale in any other manner. Uh, in reviewing this manner, uh, we looked at other municipalities who have also purchased railroad property. Those purchases were made through, by means of quick claim deeds. And this is similar to a situation when cities obtain property through tax deeds or through condemnation. The, uh, the sellers would not, of course, warrant their title uh, in those situations either. So it is something that this city has obtained uh, title before without warranty deeds. 
So having given you a little background on the deed part of it, uh, I just want to explain as uh, succinctly as I can what the responsibilities are in the uh, purchase contract with respect to the city, what uh, the railroad will be required to do and what the developers uh, later after um, closing will be required to do. Uh, first off, with respect to the city, the city is required pursuant to a 2003 a memorandum of, of understanding with state historical preservation to document the historic aspects of the parcel. And that will include um, both uh, photographing the property as well as providing uh, public information uh, concerning the property. The city will also be removing the freight house that Mr. Cotter referred to. The city will be in, uh, hiring a company to remove the tracks and the city will grade and uh, remove six inches of topsoil from the property. The city will also repair the street crossings on 6th and 8th Street. Once the tracks are removed from those crossings, of course, the city will, will need to re remove and repair them. Uh, many of these things are outlined in the 2013 documents that are on the city's website, so you probably are already familiar with them through other presentations as well. With respect to costs on that, I, those items, Josh Peterson is here and he can talk about that. I think I'm going to run out of steam. <laughs> yes. Okay, what, what does the railroad have to do? They have to uh, first, once the purchase agreement is signed, then that's an offer by the city of Sioux Falls to the railroad to purchase the property. There is on this property a right of free first refusal that the local short line, Ellison Eastern, owns. Ellison Eastern will have an opportunity to review that purchase agreement and determine whether or not that it's able or willing to meet that price. If they are not, then that right of, then um, basically they will for forfeit that right and the uh, sale would then proceed forward with the city. And they held that right of first refusal before we entered the picture. That is their right to engage in that review and determine uh, what course of action to take. Okay, uh, so BNSF needs to engage in the negotiations with Ellison Eastern. It will also, as uh, pursuant to this uh, purchase, it will build a new siding uh, for uh, tracks and then move uh, move its materials out of the freight house and move um, uh, use the new siding. It will also be required to build or satisfy Ellison Eastern with an interchange and that is part of the right now Ellison Eastern interchanges at Shoreline with on BNSF tracks it will continue to do so, but it will be doing so at a different location, and those parties need to um, make sure they're in agreement with that, and uh, BNSF will need to satisfy that interest. Um, so that's basically, in a nutshell, the purchase agreement. Josh will talk to you about the costs. Uh, I wanted to touch very briefly on the developer's responsibilities so that it's very clear uh, that this agreement will, in the future, continue to impose some obligations on whoever owns the property as it's developed and resold by the city. And one of those obligations will be that there will be an overlay district uh, to address any, uh, to address the environmental component associated with development. Uh, as stated, the city will be, uh, We'll, we'll take up the tracks, remove six inches of topsoil, regrade the, the area, and then developers will, you know, they may do various things with the property. They may um, engage in doing some digging and installing footings. They may do minimal work. It depends on what that work is. 
They will have to do it according to environmental standards. And so there will be an overlay district that will uh, apply. They will have to comply with whatever the environmental standards are. And it's the Department of Environment and Natural Resources that would be the, the uh, guidance agency on that. And then also there is a risk will be <clears throat> consistent with how railroads sell property. Uh, they want a, a um, restriction on the property that provides that whoever builds next to them recognizes there will be still a rail line there. There will still be vibration there. Uh, they, and they want to ensure on those deeds of that property that the new owners recognize that and that they will not uh, claim that the, the property is free from railroad use. Those rail lines will be near them. So those are basically the responsibilities of the parties. And I would turn it over to Josh to talk to you about the, uh, a little bit more specifics on the money part of it and the scheduling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josh Peterson with Engineering Division of Public Works. Uh, just briefly, we'll, we'll go through some of the highlights of, of the milestones and the schedule. Um, uh, there's been, I think some of the council has not, uh, is new enough to where they didn't uh, have the opportunity to hear the presentation when we first came up with this uh, plan for the rear yard redevelopment as we're going forward. Um, which was in 2012. Um, so just give you a little history that this, is, this has been the plan that we've had in the works for, for a few years now. It's just taken us some time uh, to get through the environmental assessment process, which ended in 2013. Uh, the appraisal, we completed that in 2014, and now finally reaching the uh, conclusion of the ne negotiations on the uh, purchase agreement details uh, here just this last month. Uh, going forward, uh, assuming that the council uh, uh, votes and, uh, and approves the, the authorization for this, we would expect the uh, mayor to sign once the public uh, comment period is ended, and then we would work to close on the property. Uh, and uh, outlined in the purchase agreement is an eight month, eight month time frame maximum that we would see that happening. And that's at the end of that close, that's when we would uh, cut the check for the full purchase amount minus the uh, earnest money we we would have paid. Uh, depending on how quickly that uh, closing period happens, uh, there's a potential the BNSF could start construction on those siding tracks and that e and &E connection track in the downtown area. Um, you know, it's all going to depend whether there's some seasonal uh, opportunity there or if we're going to be in into the winter months. Um, but we'll expect that potentially in 2015, uh, but 2016 and 2017 are, are, are what we have anticipated for construction, worst case scenario. And then um, hopefully in 2018, you know, then, then we would be preparing the site and, and having it ready for redevelopment. There's been some questions about uh, of the funding and where we're at with the federal funds and what, if any, um, City funds would be required, uh, both for what we've had in the past and what we would anticipate going forward. So just, I've got a um, kind of a high level summary of where we're at uh, to date with costs and some estimated costs going forward. Uh, so to start with there at the top, the original authorized federal funds of a little over 36 million. Uh, if you remember, uh, the, the year market itself was designated at $40 million. Uh, as I've been, as it's been explained to me by Federal Highway, they never um, authorize a full obligation limit for the earmark. They always reserve some funds, depending on funding, um, that they receive costs, things like that. So uh, it, it's very common for that number to be reduced right off the bat. Uh, costs we've incurred to date, 
uh, not including the rail yard purchase itself of 27 million. We've spent money on our environmental assessment process, uh, hiring a consultant to, to go through that. We've spent money on appraisals, uh, title work, and a land survey uh, for the deed of the property. So that's uh, so the total to date is uh, 28.7 million that we've spent of those uh, federal funds. And then we've also spent uh, about $300,000 uh, of local funds as well. So that brings us to about $7.4 million that we have remaining of those federal funds. Uh, and there are some co expected costs going forward that we uh, anticipate being able to spend at least a portion of that money on. And the, the four bullets there with asterisks are uh, some estimates of what we've got going forward. And I, I just want to qualify them. They're very high level at this point. We haven't done any engineering. Uh, we're going to be responsible with both federal funds and city funds going forward. We want to be as efficient as possible. But, uh, you know, full disclosure, we want to make sure you guys know where we're at and what we foresee um, going forward. So the first bullet there is uh, I, I've kind of lumped together site preparation. That's removal of the track, um, the removal of the crossings, and the restoration of pavement in 6th and 8th Street. Um, that's doing some grading in the site, uh, the mitigation of that soil. Uh, that 1.7 is for the majority of that work, and then the $500,000 of city funds is, is the estimate of what we see in the um, contaminated soil that we're going to be uh, mitigating from the site. That is not an eligible cost um, as uh, determined by Federal Highway. The freight house demolition, um, we've got um, the, the demolition itself is eligible for $50,000, uh, but we do have $10,000 there for uh, potential asbestos abatement if required. And um, a new requirement that's just recently uh, been brought to our attention is the, the northern long-eared bat is apparently a, it's not an endangered species, but it is something that's on the uh, um, federal agency's list of things we need to address. We'll have to do a survey of the building to make sure that they're not roosting there. Um, so I don't know yet if that's even, an, if that's an eligible cost, but it's, it's very minor and we think both the asbestos and the, the bat survey would fall into that $10,000. Uh, the security fence is an item that uh, we've committed to uh, as, as, I think, a mutual benefit to both the city and BNSF to provide a delineation between what's going to remain an active rail site and what we're going to see for redevelopment where we're going to have potential pedestrians. We don't want somebody inadvertently walking into an active site and, you know, getting hit by a train, getting injured. You know, this is a, this is a safety issue for us and for BNSF, um, so we've committed to um, installing that as well. And then finally, uh, one of the requirements and the commitments in, from the environmental assessment, as Diane touched on a little bit, is some historic mitigation. Uh, we've committed to um, installing an interpretive sign kiosk uh, somewhere on the site, uh, so we've got some construction costs there, um, and then the recordation <laughs> itself um, to get a snapshot of what the ray yard is today and the, and the warehouse built, freight house building that we're demolishing. Um, we want to monument that uh, to uh, let future generations know what the rail yard was in Sioux Falls and what it meant to us. And there's some um, money there uh, in city funds of $10,000. Uh, we, we're, we'll need to hire a consultant to help us perform that recordation process. Um, I do not believe there's anything on the, or a consultant that um, is on the DOT's approved list to perform that work. So uh, just in case we can't get that money eligible, I just wanted to point out that want to keep some funds available uh, in case we need it for that consultant. So that uh, summarizes where we're at. Uh, bottom uh, line there is we'll, uh, if uh, the estimates come in where we think they will, we'll spend about 
$30.5 million of state funds on the project and a little bit under a million dollars in city funds uh, to complete the work. So that, uh, open it up to questions for, the, for our team. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, we'll open it up for questions, comments from the public. Bruce Danielson. I've got a couple things here I'm going to ask Jim to put up on the screen. And, but while he's getting ready, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, Diane uh, for explaining several things that I've actually been asking questions about and trying to go into a lot of the paperwork and I can't find it. You know, we've only had the actual uh, paperwork uh, for about, well, 98 hours plus the three hours we've been sitting here tonight. So it's been very confusing trying to go through it and we can't find things. And we've been asking questions. This has been a super top secret project that nobody in town knows anything about. In fact, you people don't actually know a lot about it either as I've asked questions and you're constantly having to ask more questions because we're asking questions. And we citizens would like to be able to just have some time to actually look at what's going on here. Uh, you've had some executive sessions. We've had nothing. We've had uh, about, uh, well, the 98 hours minus about 60 hours that were involved with the weekend. So <coughs> we're just kind of doing a crash course going through this. And so, go ahead and put the first one. So uh, I really appreciated this piece right here. And I was looking at the, the discussion. Well, I sent out an email over the weekend to all of you. And, that were just some things that were kind of bothering me and actually Diane answered a few of the questions and I appreciated that. So I'm looking at uh, tonight when I got here and I see $344,700 that's being involved with the appraisals and the title survey to, to make sure that we have property that actually matches everything and that, that uh, I understood at the press conference the mayor had, there was a section of property that actually doesn't even have a title for some reason or another. They aren't able to search it out. So it, that just opened up more questions it's, that uh, I decided to go back and look at some old paperwork that's been bothering me from, from the March, uh, March 10th of this year when there was some other railroad property that's been sold. And this one right here. And so if you, if you remember this, this is up at the, uh, uh, up by Falls Park, and you'll see where the yellow is there, and you'll see the, uh, where it's that piece of property where the origami statue was. And that's another question, whatever happened to the origami statue, and when, where's it going to be placed? But that goes beyond it. But, Here's the, uh, uh, so the question is, I, I started looking at this parcel, and I'll try and go through this quickly. So, so just a, as a close up, here's the, the street North Phillips going into Falls Park under the railroad trestle. And this is some, some land that's involved with the Milwaukee Road line that used to go up through that area. And, this, and the city of Sioux Falls in 2006 uh, received this property with a uh, like a 1.7 million dollar purchase of land uh, with the state of South Dakota, and so I've been trying to understand how this whole process went together. And you can do the next one, Jim. So as I was going through the paperwork, which we didn't get ahead of time, very much ahead of time. So then we started looking. Oh no, just the ones with the little tags on it. I'm sorry. And so we see the, uh, this is the uh, memorandum of understanding that, that w was voted on here in the council. This is the paperwork that went with it. And I, and I noticed something, and this is, this is what's been bugging me is, uh, we citizens who like to look at this kind of stuff uh, now have a chance to go back and see this paperwork. <laughs> And I, and I noticed a little quirk in here, which is probably gonna require city council action to re-vote on this item or to pass the item because, you wanna pull the next tags up there, Jim? 
sorry about this. It's uh, discovered the, uh, if you look here, this was uh, voted on and signed back in March 10th of 2015. And the speed in which this was done and the way that we weren't able to actually look at things, I see that, that we have a date here in the future. It was as if we were in some kind of a time warp. And we have the uh, documentation, everything that's done here is done in December of 2015, and we haven't quite gotten there yet. <coughs> and that's what I'm trying to get by, that's what I was trying to explain in the, in the email. And there's another one here, Jim, if you want to do the last one. And that we're actually just asking for a chance to look at this information, and now we've got a contract that's in the drawer that any other situation that I've run into when somebody's messed up on a date, uh, I have a situation where we lost $2 million because somebody missed a date. And I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at a $27 million railroad project, and none of us have had a chance to look at it, and I'm now looking at another railroad contract that was post-dated. How many of your banks would take a post-dated check? I mean, I don't know if this council understands how bad this is. This speaks badly of that $344,700. It speaks badly about getting the property in the first place. We have property that came as a quit claim deed. There's nothing in this bundle that shows how all of that quit claim deed was converted into a warranty deed so it could be sold legally to these people. And then we give them a contract that isn't even the correct date. So I just wanted to uh, try and explain this weekend, and I appreciate the people that did get back with me this weekend, and I was still digging through all of this as I was putting all this together, and it was just bothering me all the more. It's, there's, I'm not finding pieces put together the way they need to be put together, and this is serious. And now we're gonna vote on this thing tonight, and we haven't had a chance to look at it. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and good luck. Mr. Chair, can I ask uh, Bruce about what is the, the correct date supposed to be on this? Well, uh, apparently it's sometime around March 10th or, or March, March 10th. 30th or sometime in there. I, I understand there's a 20-day period that the mayor then can sign and it should have been finished. That's my understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in these matters. I'm, I'm learning and I'm learning the hard way. March 10th, March 30th of, 20, well, if, of 2015. Exactly. And then of course the notary public had an expired. Commission. Well, it shows the notary, uh, notary public actually had an expired. If, if it was a December 15th, 2015, it's that goes good. back and shows that she was signing this as an expired notary. So, I mean, the whole thing is just a mess. And that's what I'm concerned about, and those of us that have been talking about this railroad project, is we want to be part of this. And we would have maybe seen this, and, and I'm sure you've, you've, you know, the city and these fine people back here have done a good job trying to put this together. Extra eyes don't hurt. And now you guys are gonna to have to go back and fix this other issue so that you don't have fallout from it. And we know that there's more problems involved with this land deal. And we just wanna be able to be part of it and have public testimony, public hearings that lay this out. Tonight is the best explanation I've had for this because there wasn't a lot of hype here. This actually told us the bare minimum we needed, but still we would like to see the deeds, we would like to see the research that's been done, and it's a very simple thing that we want to have is just some hearings. Even if it's a working session, if it's an informational that we can be part of, that we can actually say, yep, we agree with you, and because we know the railroad project gets, needs to get done. I've been talking to railroad people, and they're telling me that this railroad project 
you know, the type of rail yard that's down here doesn't work for the modern trains, the mile long trains and so on. Okay, that's fine. But then again, we still have the south rail yard that's still gonna be used. And so we're still gonna have a lot of traffic through this area. And when you bring up the south rail yard, like it happened with me, it's like, we've got a south rail yard. Yeah, you know, we got actually train track all the way to 26th Street. So they're gonna still be stacking trains. They're gonna be using that. But we, don't, we aren't getting any answers on any of that stuff either. And we would like to know how this rail yard is actually going to be used, and we'd like to have the paperwork signed properly. Thank you. Council, or excuse me, before we do that, is there any other public testimony? Seeing none, City Council. Councilor from Bach. Thank you. Diane, could you address the concerns Mr. Danielson had about the dating on that particular project? Uh, first project. off, it wasn't something that, that I'm familiar with. I mean, other than I know that the stock, where the Stockwell property is and that that transaction occurred. Uh, this first I uh, realized that there was a 2015 date on something that was, looked like it was apparently supposed to be 2014 or that it was, should have been earlier in 2015. It looked like a typographical error to me. I, I cannot tell you right now whether that was already identified and corrected before the mayor signed it or not. Um, I hope it was. If it was not, it, it, that needs to be redone. I, I would agree with Bruce on that. If there was an error, there was an error. Um, but that's... Is that a material, is that a, a, something that's of material value in this conversation, though? Is that something that should hold us up from voting tonight? I can't I mean, imagine these... why it would, because if there was a typographical error on the dating of a previous contract, you wouldn't be able to see that on this contract because the signatures are not there yet. That's what we're asking for. Right. So there's no dates like that. But uh, good point. Uh, it's all about transparency. Let's, you know, let's look at those contracts. Let's take a hard look, and we'll certainly, as we move th through it, make sure that it is absolutely uh, dated and uh, uh, executed correctly. That would be an embarrassing thing if it weren't, and we'll make sure it's done correctly. Um, I would also point out that, um, as I indicated, a significant number of documents about this matter, maps, environmental review, are on the city's website, and the title history is at the uh, Minnehaha County Register of Deeds. Um, and then further, I, I, you know, I just have to disclose for, <laughs> for the council's information. I talked to Bruce Danielson three times on Friday about a sanitary sewer matter. And uh, if there were questions about the railroad then, you know, I'd be happy to visit with him. Now, I appreciate the fact that the contract itself um, was not on the system. Maybe, maybe he didn't realize it was on the system by the time I talked to him or whatever. It was, you know, the same day. But even so, if he, the press release had occurred uh, earlier that this was going forward, and if Bruce had any questions, I would have been more than happy to answer them. Uh, limited, of course to this federal law situation on the appraisal that I talked about earlier. Then would you remind me, I, I asked you about this the other day, the, the two-year time period. What's, what, what are you going to be doing during that two years from the time that we kind of sign this agreement and then we actually get the land? What are you doing during that time uh, on this project? Well, a couple things. First off, um, on the two years, that two years is the maximum amount of time. Right. Right. So if BNSF gets its railroad siding built sooner, we'll be able to turn around and pull up the tracks and, and regrade sooner. So we're optimistic it could be sooner. Uh, the railroad obviously is cautious, two year time frame, couple construction seasons, we're hopeful it'd take one. So having said that, um, we will um, be engaged in working on that historical documentation because what's needed is the state of the of the um, the trackage and the state of the freight house as it existed you know, before removal, as it currently sits today. 
not as, I mean, there's already documentation of 40 years ago, but there needs to be the, some additional documentation of how it sits today as well. So that will be, that will be proceeding. And then um, I do not, we don't have confirmation yet on this, but uh, if we are able to gain entry to the freight house and start working on, on moving forward with getting that removed, that's a possibility. Um, they technically would have the right to um, maintain their belongings in the freight house until the two-year period is expired. So that, that's something we maybe could do. But at a minimum, we would be able to get our contractors lined up for both the track removal and the freight house and, and get that uh, bid process undertaken. Good. Thank you. If I might, Mr. Chair, I just uh, or would prefer to not act as a lawyer in this process that that I would invite, as I always do, the citizens to visit our website at SiouxFalls.org and spend time with those documents that have been out there for a period of time and that, and that are there now. And I would just ask that the council go ahead and, and approve this tonight. Is that a motion? That, yeah, if you would like me to make a motion, I would be happy to make that motion to approve, yes. Rolfing will second. Councilman Jamison. Diane or Mark, a uh, couple questions if I could. The, uh, Building of the new siding by BNSF, how do they obtain that land? Do they purchase it from the landowner or do they kind of just take it? Uh, defer to Josh, but I think the majority, if not all, they already own. Because uh, that area of the uh, of their rail corridor. Josh, uh, do you want to add to that? Yes, from what we, from what we looked at, the the siding that they have planned to construct out along Rice Street, the majority of that is within their existing right of way. They've got a little bit wider right of way there than what you would typically see, um, which is a benefit for them. If they do need to purchase anything there, whether it's a permanent right of way or temporary construction easement, they are required to follow the same federal land acquisition standards that the city was in this. They're required to follow that same uniform act. So they would have to negotiate, do appraisals, whatever it takes to, you know, uh, acquire that land. Okay. And then as well, uh, the fence that's going to be put up, is that on the east side or the west side or both? It, it'll be just on the east side of the property we're going to obtain um, between uh, where It'll be between the uh, east side of our property, west of the rail, railroad's property, that dividing line between us. Um, Mark's tracing it with the cursor there. Slow down again, say that again. The fence will be on which it, side of the active track? West side of the active track. What about the people on the east side? Why would they not be afforded the same kind of... I mean, we're creating uh, e east of the active track. Um, that that that's a little bit different land use than what we're expecting on the west uh, of the property we're purchasing. Uh, we don't we won't own any of that property to construct a fence. But if that's something you know we're interested in, uh, you know, I think it's something we could definitely explore. We are only contractually obligated through our agreement with BNSF to construct it on the west side of the active tracks. Gotcha, okay. And then as well, the purchase of the land many years ago from, it wasn't, it wasn't as though, I think you referred to, they didn't just take it or it wasn't gifted to them by the federal government. It was actually purchased from property owners within the city. So they did pay for it once. The land, the, it wasn't. It wasn't $27 million, of course, 100 and <laughs> some years ago, but they did pay for it. And uh, or their predecessors paid for it. Right, and, and I've just got to make a statement here. I, I can't, can't get past this. I, you know, this is a dinosaur, this whole earmark, the whole process, the whole thing is, an, is a dinosaur. You talk about the transparency that's lacking because of the federal law in place. <laughs> Craziness, that wouldn't happen today. No way would we do this with our own sales tax money. The threshold of, of allowing an earmark to do this is, is uh, it's understandable why they're outlawed. Because we can't provide the transparency to the public. We can tell them it's $27 million, $334,500, but there's no rationale 
for the number, not based on the land. We can't understand the appraisals. They told us what the number was going to be, and they kind of, uh, you know, we have, I just don't think a, a position at all for bargaining. <coughs> we're, we're, we're thankful they're moving. We're thankful for the earmark. You can't argue with those things, but this would never happen again. And this is like a dealing with a dinosaur. It's been interesting for me to understand it and see it and watch you guys go through it and even our city understand it and absorb it. Um, it's just ironic that, that, <coughs> that they probably paid a few thousand dollars for this land 100 some years ago. We're paying them $27 million for it. They're leaving it contaminated for us to clean up. Um, and we can't tell the public, frankly, how much we're paying for the land and how much we're paying for the inconvenience of them to move. Um, I guess it's, it's the way it is, I guess. It's, but it's interesting that this is a, a dinosaur that is on its way out. Can't help but get past this whole thing. It's kind of, I don't know who else in the country is dealing with an earmark that is this old. And uh, anyway, I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> Councilor Staggers. Uh, Diane, <coughs> the city's getting a quick claim. And then once we get that, yes. and then we sell it to a developer, what kind of deed will they most likely get? We would take the quit claim. We would take the information we've obtained as a result of our due diligence in examining the titles. We would go to a court, get a court order confirming that we have full and complete title, and then we would convey by a warranty deed. Warranty deed, okay. Also, can I ask a couple Continue, more? Counsel. Looking at the contract, it talks about the buyer will pay all closing costs. Um, is there any place in these numbers that we've been given where the, the closing costs are at? Uh, a significant amount of that would go to First Dakota Title, and so some of that is in some of the work that First Dakota Title has already done. And they, they went back and looked at all the recorded easements and that and also the title, so. And how much we paid them, and how much, how much we paid in total closing costs? That's normally associated, you know, money that's normally associated with closing costs. What's in the breakdown today um, in that appraisals title survey? That's the appraisals we've done. Uh, that is the costs for the title work and the title insurance we will be buying. Uh, we haven't paid that yet, but it is part of the costs and the, the land survey that we did on the work. I believe there's some minor uh, filing fees at the courthouse, closing costs for, for the title company. I didn't have those numbers, so I didn't put it in here, but I think it's in the order of you know five to ten thousand dollars. Does that oh, sound reasonable? The uh, recording I don't, fees would be less than, okay. may, less than that, I guess. And then just one other question I have. It's under, it's in the contract. It's under purchase and sale. I think it's subparagraph D. Here's a quote. May include payment by buyer to the seller for seller's construction of railroad facilities as necessary to make BNSF's interests whole. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> What that means is, is that because this purchase is made under the Federal Uniform Act, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, it's the same act that is used for building highways. And so when you go and purchase the land for a highway and say, for example, there's a factory there, you don't just purchase the land. You've got to make that factory whole. If they're willing to move it, you figure out a way to, to pay them to move it. Um, it's that sort of cost. That's the typical cost you would say with Federal Highway, but, but it's the same act that applies here. And so basically, um, they, to make them whole means basically that they're going out and, and building a new siding. So we're the buyer. Yes. And this is just very general. Are we going to get stuck with anything else in the future? 
No, no, the, the, the entire package is that 27, 334.5. So why do we have that in there? Because that's part of the, that's part of the purchase, that we are purchasing 10 acres, freight mm -hmm. house, tracks, and making them whole. It's all part of the package. Councilor Kiley. Uh, just a quick question uh, regarding the uh, security fence as to when that's actually necessary. I'm assuming that uh, during the site preparation and demolition it would go up. We're tied to that. That's in the contract as well. Yes, uh, we, we outlined the timeline for that, that we have committed to install that um, within 180 days of after the the two-year easement where BNSF is occupying the yard, once that ends, then we will install that fence within 180 days. So we may have some security fence that we can repurpose from a current project? The, this, the, we, we've committed to something it, as part of our historic mitigation commitments. The, the fence that we need to install needs to be compatible with the historic nature of downtown. Um, we're, we're not looking at- I'm uh, sorry, I thought that was a security fence for just during the demo process. This, you're talking no, a permanent the, fence. This is a permanent yeah, fence. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions for the council? I have one question, I guess. Uh, uh, Diane, you and I spoke about uh, the different items that can be utilized uh, or can be completed using the federal funds. And at the end of the sale and everything, we're going to have around $7 million left over. But the way that this is structured or the way that the federal government has told us, there's only certain things that we can use that money for on property, correct? Yes, I think Mark. Probably. Well, that's uh, that's correct, and that's why we tried to um, about halfway down where the asterisks start, where we start to identify what we've uh, talked to them about, what's eligible and what's not. So the first column of state and federal eligible, they will qualify the track removal as a qualifying item, which is the which is the key large item, the paving and the grading, the removal. What they the key item of those costs. Probably the two is, um, once the tracks and the ties are removed, um, what we've seen in the borings was in that top area is where we've seen the majority of the um, petroleum um, contaminants. They don't fund uh, environmental uh, uh, cleanup. And so that's why we've identified what we believe is a conservative number, but that doesn't qualify, nor does the security fence. Okay. How about as we uh, remove the tracks yeah. and we have to repair the roadway, uh, we've discussed that also. Uh, is that something that is going, are we going to continue to discuss that with them or is that something that we can utilize those funds to do? That, that does qualify, Councillor. They do pay for the removal of the tracks, the ties, and also the, um, once the tracks and ties come out of 6th and 8th Street, the new pavement that qualifies. So that's a federally, uh, that's that track removal, paving, and grading in parents. So then when we're, f we're completely finished, we will be leaving some money on the table and that will go back to the federal government, I take it. Uh, that, is, that is correct. They, they, they don't obligate us up to the full 40 million to start with. Um, they have an obligation limit just to make sure that they uh, get enough revenue and to cover their obligations and that's why we started at 36.2 million but ultimately if it's not if it doesn't qualify specifically for this project because Congress authorized it specific to this um, funds that are not used go back to Congress also the proceeds of the sale of the parcels those proceeds have to by uh, federal law be reinvested into roads uh, in our area, and so those are that's another requirement that we'll be managing later. Okay, thank you. Yep, Council Mikarski. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I think you just answered my question. So, we get five million, whatever dollar amount it is, 
for, when we sell the land to a developer, we have to put that money back into roads? The government isn't expecting any money back from the sale of the land? No, what we've been, uh, what we've been advised by Federal Highway is that proceeds that come, whether this is sold in one parcel of trackage sale or say three, um, whatever proceeds come into the city for that, we have to demonstrate that we've put those back into what we call federal aid routes, which are essentially arterial streets. And we would identify a specific project and, and direct those proceeds into them. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the council? Motions? <coughs> we have a motion on the table, don't we? Yeah, motion and a second, yep. All right, with that, we can do a roll call. Council members, Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. That passes 8 nothing. Item 45. History. Item 45 is a report of the July 28, 2015 Notice of Transfer of Appropriations within Major Organizational Units. Okay. Is Move to adjourn. Okay. Second, Erpenbach. There. Uh, Councilor Stagg. Yeah, could I ask the City Council to do something with that previous document that we saw with the wrong dates? And with the... Um, we'll, we'll have the legal take a look at that, Counselor. And can we have a report back by a certain time? Um, I'll, I'll re just request that they take a look at that, and as soon as they get a reply back to us, I'll make sure that you get that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. We, we did. We do a voice did. vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. This is meeting is now adjourned. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Come on, let's go, come on.